Thank you everyone for joining today's workshop, which is just one of a four part series that's gonna happen through the month of January. The title of the series is Immersive Experiences. And um, the title for today's session is Shifting Time, Space, Things and Learning. So my name is Robin Sullivan. If you need to find me in the UB directory, you need to look me up as Roberta, but everybody calls me Robin. And I know almost everyone on the call, not everybody. So um, if you haven't, if we haven't met, please make a point, you know, look me up and uh, maybe we can get together. So I just wanna start this session with a little bit of a disclaimer. Um, because technology changes so rapidly, Nobody is an expert in all fields, and I want to mention that I am definitely not an expert in the field of augmented and virtual reality and mixed realities, but I am, have been trying to make myself more aware of some of the new trends that are coming up on the horizon. Um, but this quote actually um, you know, just kind of captured what I wanted to frame our talk with, that um, folks who have access to tech tools are more likely to be lifelong learners. That's kind of a requirement. You can't expect to learn something and expect that learning to take you through uh, up until the future. You need to be able to be a lifelong learner to continually uh, research and find and keep up with what's happening. So um, we are all learners in this new frontier. If anyone has any examples of resources or comments that they'd like to share, something that I'm glossing over that you want to highlight, please speak up. We're a nice small group, so um, you know we don't need to do any formalities. Um, you know, feel free to use the chat and share examples, but also feel free to unmute. Um, and interrupt when needed, and um, hopefully we can have a little bit of a conversation. So the slides are available at this URL. Um, it's bit.ly, B-I-T dot L-Y slash I-X dash, and then today's date, um, 010622. They will also be available to you, including the recordings in the UB Learns course that has been set up. Everybody will be enrolled into that course as soon as um, the recordings are available and you'll be able to access the recordings and the URL. But yes, Cindy, I will type that into the chat. Um, bit.ly slash I X dash in today's date, 010622. That should get you there. So you can follow along. So you can click on the links yourself. Um, I'll be demonstrating things, but there's a lot of the links that I'm not going to be clicking on. And so, um, you know, feel free to use this as a resource as we go forward for your own exploration. Thank you. Um, so today what we're going to do is we will explore a variety of simulated experiences, kind of just a very broad cursory overview. Um, and we will identify some applications that are being used for learning and also through the libraries. And we'll also at the end, um, there's some uh, links to much of the research that's been released about immersive experiences and we'll talk about some of that as well. So I mentioned that this is just the first of a four part series, the future sessions. Um, this session is gonna be pretty much pretty passive. Um, I'm gonna be sharing information. It'll be um, you know an hour long dis uh, presentation, but please make it an interactive discussion where we can. Um, the next sessions are gonna be more hands-on and exploration. So next week when um, Thursday comes around, we'll use Google Street View to create 360, vir 360 degree virtual tours. The week after that, we will explore some tours in Google Arts and Culture and other VR tours. And um, then we will also, the final week of January, we'll create some augmented reality using the Merge Cube. So those sessions are gonna be like a half hour activity. And then the second half will be self-exploration and more Q&A and discussion. 
So just one of the resources I wanted to share is the history of augmented and virtual reality, just to kind of give us some context. So if you click on the image or the link, it brings you to this really nice infographic that just gives um, kind of a starting point. So it says that virtual reality has actually been um, started going back to the stereoscope. I'm gonna try to keep that theme going in the next few slides. Um, you know, just gives you a little bit of timeline on this infographic, um, talking about flight simulators. Um, the Viewmaster is actually, if you think about it, a part of a virtual reality. And uh, one of the other ones, I think in 1962, they had Sensorama. Um, so the smell of hot dogs kind of uh, permeated the environment as you were on this simulated motorcycle ride. Um, to kind of make it seem as real as it possibly can. So I'm not going to go into that in too much depth, but I wanted to um, bring it back even further. So I think that virtual reality, what that tries to do is it tries to simulate the current reality, tries to simulate um, something that I might be seeing in my real-time vision, and I want to capture that and make that story available for somebody that's not going to be in the same place or the same time as me sometime in the future. And the Lascaux cave paintings are probably a really good example of the first example, first time that that might have happened. So you had uh, the cave dwellers who um, used blood and um, rocks and other pigments and materials to create these beautiful drawings on the side of the caves. What could possibly be the case is that they were trying to share that story with somebody that was going to be in that situation in that cave at a later time. Um, one of the links on the screen brings you to a Google Arts and Culture tour of the Lascaux Caves. And um, it's just uh, a really nice example um, just to get us started thinking where did virtual reality start and where is it going? The um, kind of another evolution in that. So we had those drawn images on the side of the caves. You can kind of think that photographs are simulating reality. So it's taking what, it, what reality is, putting it together in what it used to be film and now in digital pixels and trying to recreate what somebody saw in their real life reality and saving that for someone else to view at a later point. The stereoscope, which you saw on that history infographic, um, is another evolution. And one thing you'll um, see, the slides that are in the stereoscope image on the left, those two images are merged together to make it look a little bit more three-dimensional. So a little bit more real than a flat photo is able to do. The image on the right, I kind of like the way that that looks very close to what the current um, handheld virtual reality viewers look like now. Um, and that was from 1870. Another concept I kind of want to walk us through is what is the difference between virtual reality, augmented reality, mixed reality, and extended reality? So VR, AR, MR, XR, that's kind of the series of letters that people are using. And virtual reality, um, if you think about it, um, it blocks out the room and everything that, um, all of the reality around you. And it puts the presence of that person in another place. I'm gonna just pop to the next slide just for a second. So if you see the gentleman on the screen, he's got a virtual reality headset on and he, he's definitely, it's a virtual reality headset. You could see that it says Oculus on his headband and you can also see this one happens to be a wired or they also call it a tethered version of the headset. And so things that he's looking at, he's not seeing reality at all. He is looking at something that is simulated, some kind of film or digital model or rendering and reality is completely blocked out of his image, what he's looking at. In comparison, if you think of augmented reality, what that is, is that um, you're looking through some kind of device, whether it's 
set that looks similar to what he was wearing. Um, but augmented reality, the difference is that you're able to see reality on the other side of that device and you can uh, digitally overlay uh, something into that environment. So it doesn't really move us into that other environment completely. Um, what it does is it augments or it adds something on top. Um, so, so I'm uh, going to um, go now to the slide that talks about augmented reality. This um, picture of augmented reality is, is using the device that they don't even have goggles on, but they're able to hold up, uh, this seems to be an iPad, it could be any kind of tablet. And the place that they're looking at, you can tell that it's a little um, not maintained. The walls are all um, down to the raw brick. And um, the part that he's looking at through the, um, through the tablet, is possibly letting them look at what that looked like when it was in its full glory. So he's augmenting, he's um, looking at reality, but it, but the augmented reality is actually inserting something into his view that's not normally there. Um, another device that you can use, or an inexpensive device that you can use to experience either virtual reality or augmented reality is, um, they used to call them Google Cardboards. Um, Google Cardboard is, has actually quit manufacturing this device. Um, it's just a, one of those um, headsets, but it's made out of cardboard. You can also go online and um, you can print out a, a pattern that you can take a pizza box, cut it out to the right shape, fold it in the right way, and get these really inexpensive uh, plastic lenses, which can happen to be also printed on a 3D printer if you really wanted to do that. Um, and they can be made very inexpensively, but you can also purchase them uh, for like $2, $4, $10. They are a dime. Yeah, Cindy says $5 on Amazon. Um, if you buy them in bulk, you can get them much cheaper. And um, I will have some of these on hand at Silverman next week. And so when we're playing and creating Google Street View tours, we can actually look at them through these, through this uh, cardboard-like device, and you can see it um, as you turn your head and turn around and look. Um, so you can also look at augmented reality using these. So what they have a cutout on the front that lets the camera look at the reality in front, and then the phone or device inside projects the digital or manufactured item in your view. The next piece I just want to introduce is interactive print and augmented reality. And um, this is a picture of the virtuality t-shirt. And what you see on the screen is a t-shirt that kind of looks like the chest cavity, um, the bone structure. And I think as soon as I, it's hard in a virtual environment to show this, but um, I, I'll bring this with me next week to Silverman as well. And what you do is you take your phone or tablet or whatever, and you look at somebody wearing the t-shirt. And actually, I think it's, this is, happens to be a upright version of it. And what you would see in your phone is the lungs breathing, um, the heart beating, and it's really just a very different experience to see that in context. You know, you can see a picture in a book, but if you see the heart beating kind of where it's supposed to be beating on the real life person, it makes an impact. So um, if you're possibly familiar with a QR code. Um, a QR code is just a square image that has a lot of um, uh, dots on it. This T-shirt is kind of just a QR code that happens to be shaped like the skeleton. And so the QR codes can be used to trigger an augmented or a virtual reality 
image to show up like this lungs and heart. Um, also, it can be used, um, you can now even take the tablet and in that last image where someone was uh, looking at that decrepit room that kind of needed maintenance, that room, that image can be a trigger. So the computer says, oh, I recognize that uh, this image is shaped exactly like the trigger that's in my program. So I am now going to load the image of what this room looked like 100 years ago. So you don't even need the traditional square QR codes anymore. You can use just um, different shapes. If anyone has any comments as we're going through, please feel free to interrupt. Um, Kevin, I like your comment there. Um, yeah, I had, um, um, you know, this t-shirt is really interesting to see in person. It's kind of hard to demonstrate augmented and virtual reality through this um, non-in-person environment. So hopefully you go and you click on the links and you can watch some of the videos and experience it for yourself. So another thing um, that I wanted to talk about is the continuum. So on the left side of this screen, you have what is the very real environment. So if you're standing in a field and you're looking at a tree, that's a direct view of that reality. On the right side of this continuum, you have a fully interactive virtual reality. So anywhere you look, nothing is real. Everything is rendered or an image or video um, or 3D models. But somewhere in between, you have a continuum where something might be, um, you know, augmented reality is kind of not real, not fully virtual, it's partially in between. Um, it, augmented virtuality is when you have real objects that are working and controlling real, I'm sorry, you have real objects controlled in virtual worlds. So you might have a machine that you're trying to use, but you're able to use the, um, the surgery tools in one country, but yet they are actually being manipulated in another country. Um, so there's just those continuums that, um, and so when you get into the middle two items, those are co considered the mixed reality, the MR, and um, the XR stands for extended reality. So that is pretty much everything. It's kind of the umbrella term. Anybody have any comments about that or another way to express that to make it a little bit even clearer? Um, so hopefully if you leave today, if uh, you know the, the um, it was kind of mixed reality was always, it's still a little cloudy in my mind um, and augmented. If you think of something that is added to reality. Um, if you augmented reality, a great example is the Pokemon game. So you might want to think of that. Um, so the um, next concept I want to introduce is 3D modeling and printing. Pretty much anything can be created nowadays with um, 3D printers. And Dom, I'm glad that you're on our call here. I might even ask you to talk a little bit about the 3D printer farm that's over in the Center for the Arts. Um, but nowadays you can get a 3D printer for less than $100. And it may not be the most robust 3D printer, but it's just showing that, um, you know, just a few years back, your basic printer was still thousands and thousands of dollars. You can now just for a couple hundred dollars, get a really decent 3D printer and the one that's less than 100, it's probably more on the kid style version. Um, and the ones that we have in the School of the Arts, um, in our School of Engineering, Architecture, down on the medical campus, I'm sure many of them are in the many thousands of dollars. Um, so you can print nowadays almost any material. Um, I've seen 3D printed chocolate. I've seen um, uh, metal that's printed in 3D. A lot of things that are manufactured nowadays are manufactured with 3D printers. 
um, it, Dom is talking about some of the printers that they have down in the art department, uh, MakerBot, Prusa, and Form Labs. And Dom, that is a service that if somebody would like to have something printed, are they able to contact the department and pay for some of that? Or does that- We don't, yeah, we don't quite have it set up as a service center yet, although we might because it is becoming more popular. I think the School of Engineering's lab is a lot more full featured and, and they are set up to uh, run jobs on a number of different machines. Uh, mostly it's just our art students and faculty who are using it. But, uh, you know, on a case by case basis, if you're interested in just experimenting, playing around, we'd love to see that happening. Uh, we've done a little bit of collaboration with some other departments. Uh, basically, the MakerBot and the Prusa are filament based printers, and we're using mostly PLA, it's a corn based resin. And the Form Labs is a a liquid uh, stereolithography printer. So the, the 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 objects actually rise out of this primordial goo uh, as they're hardened by a laser scan. And that ends up being a, a much more solid, higher resolution object. Um, and, you know, we've created some sculptural sculptural pieces. We've created some, sci uh, some biology lab equipment, uh, a whole range of things. Thanks, thanks, that's really cool. Um, yeah, I was able to take a look at some of the stuff that you have going on in the art department and it's really very interesting and it's amazing what we can do nowadays that we couldn't do last year or what we couldn't do a couple years before. Um, I visited the medical school um, maybe last, or had to be maybe two years ago at least, and they just got delivered a 3D printer that printed human cells. And um, so that's just kind of the very end of the spectrum that um, you can print just about anything nowadays. It doesn't have to be just paper. And so how do you get those 3D models? Um, one of the newest technologies to be introduced is called LIDAR. And what that stands for is light detection and, um, and ranging. And um, what you could do, LiDAR is available on the iPhone, uh, newer models, I think the 12 Pro Max and um, the iPad Pro. Not 100% sure if it's on Android devices yet. I don't think it comes standard, um, but you can get add-on pieces for pretty much any phone. Uh, contractors, architects, they've been using this for quite a while. Um, many of them have specialized devices. But what you would do, um, you know, if you have one of the newer phones or iPads or a device that you can get a LiDAR app, you would download the app onto your phone. And then in the room, I would just, um, that first column is kind of showing that you take your phone and you start to just paint the wall and the middle image shows that um, the area in gray checkers still needs to be painted. And as you have your phone move over that room or that space, it automatically creates a 3D rendering of that space um, or of that object, whatever that might be. Um, so it's kind of a, you know one of the newer things that are coming out. And it will allow, <clears throat> there was um, um, you know, some 3D, some apps that uh, you, know, you could just take and do a number of images on the phone and then the artificial intelligence will stitch those images together and give you a 3D version of the room or the object. And you can also use it for measuring. Um, you know, there's a ruler on that. Um, side. So if you needed to know how tall is that chair, you can use the LiDAR technology to, to figure that out. Um, another environment that I want to introduce in this session that's just a really broad overview is virtual simulations. So on the um, left side of the screen here, you see a Labster virtual lab simulation. And that is a virtual environment. Um, it is something that is a licensed proprietary platform. I think it's a bit expensive, but if you need to simulate science lab experience or medical lab environments, it's a great platform. And it was probably, I think the first um, maybe virtual reality experience that I was able to actually be involved with. Um, 
there's a number of challenges that relate to using these XR environments. One of them is that um, some people might tend to get a little motion sickness in these environments. So it's something, and when I first experienced the lobster, that happened to me. So there's a number of things you can do to kind of avoid that, but there are, um, you know, it's just a really interesting way. If you, you, it's not easy to simulate these experiences. There's a lot of expense going into being able to um, put together a lab or put together these experiences. In Labster, you can actually interact. The blue hand would represent the hand of the person that is um, in the environment. And you can say, pick up the pipe or run this experiment or, um, and then it will interactively give you feedback. Um, so Cindy's talking about, um, oh, they have some goggles you wear underneath your headset. Oh, so you actually have a pair, Cindy. That is nice to know. Jim Woodlock, um, one of our great um, UB constituents. Unfortunately, he passed away just very recently. So I'm going to take a second to remember him. Good friend. Um, but yeah, I'd love to see those goggles. And um, I, we should look into seeing if we can get some uh, at Silverman when we finally get some virtual reality headsets to share out as well. Thank you, Cindy. So back to the simulations, you have um, the lobster simulation on the left side and on the right side, I put in the uh, FET interactive simulations. And that's um, a activity that was created through the University of Colorado Boulder. That's one of the free simulations that are available online. All you need is the internet. Um, you can get to it by clicking the link on the slides. And they have a lot of interactive experiences. This one happens to be showing or helping to teach projectile motion. So this is not a 3D rendering. This is a 2D flat illustration, but it's made interactive. So somebody can say, okay, so if I'm uh, using the initial speed of, you know, whatever the speed is that you want to check, you can move that slider and then run the simulation and it'll show you, did you hit your mark? Did you get um, the ball or whatever the cannon to go into the right place where you want it to go? Um, another option that I wanted to share with you is the um, anatomy, I'm gonna have to look up the pronunciation of that, um, imaging. And I do believe that our medical school has one of these as well. I was able to see one in person a few years ago. And what this reminds me of is um, a huge iPad, um, but maybe used more like a table. And so um, this, um, six foot long table, seven foot long table has a rendering of the human anatomy. And you can change different views. You can turn that uh, cadaver around. You can say, only show me the nerves, only show me the bones. Um, I need to see what a liver looks like with a particular tumor. Um, it's programmable and it is, um, something that's used pretty well in the uh, medical profession. And I'm pretty sure that there might be one floating around UB somewhere in our medical school. Um, yeah, I think Cindy, yeah, I think the medical school does have one somewhere. Thanks. So another um, technology that I wanted to share, I wanna try to leave us some time for some question and answer as well. Um, the Z space technology. So again, one of the disadvantages of virtual reality is uh, most often those goggles, they remove all of the external real world. So very often you are, it's a very isolating experience. It, by using something like Z space, you notice the students all have uh, goggles on. And those goggles allow them to see the um, 3D projected environment. Um, oops, sorry. I'm gonna play this just for a second, just to give you a little better overview. 
so the students can look at this together and they can say, oh, I'm moving this around. Um, it's being used in the Buffalo school system. And um, also it's used, I think, in one of the SUNY systems for auto repair. So just hopefully that little bit gave you um, a preview of what the Z-Space environment is all about. But it's um, kind of one of those mixed reality that it's mixing um, some of the rendered environment with the real space and allowing multiple people to see that at the same time. So um, one thing I wanna um, express is that just because we can use all these great technologies doesn't mean we always should. So on the one side of the screen, you have a picture of a real live heart. Um, and on the right side, you have a flattened 2D illustration. If you had to tell me where the left atrium is located, it might be much harder to do on the real heart image because you can't more clearly see the different parts. If, um, you know, if you needed to, if you wanted to render that, in this flat 2D illustration that might be better suited for whatever you're trying to do.